I'm Max, and this is Paul, my colleague, and we're from IBM Research, and we're going to talk to you about how to run quantum safe applications, especially for Kubernetes. So we've been uh, experimenting in that space for a while. Obviously, IBM has a big quantum uh, division. We're actually part of that division, but we're also doing um, AI, which is kind of weird. Why are you doing AI and quantum? Well, there's good reasons, but we're not going to talk about that. But of course, ask questions later if you're interested. So this is who we are. There's a lot to cover. I'm going to do the first part, which is sort of the basics of quantum computing, uh, the, what we're doing in quantum safe, why you want to be quantum safe. And then I'll pass it to Paul, who's going to do the harder part, where he's going to talk about how we took our platform, uh, our quantum platform. Uh, so if you go to ibm.com slash quantum, we have a platform that you can actually use right now. And it's obviously running on Kubernetes for the uh, services parts. And we converted that, or we made it quantum safe. So he's going to go into the details of that. So hopefully that gives you a complete overview. So with that, let's get started. So this is the agenda, right? Understanding the risk, becoming quantum safe, and what you can do, like the open source stuff that we're doing. We're very excited about that. And uh, of course, the protecting applications next steps. So let's get started. So why quantum, right? Which is kind of the first thing. I, I think the way to remember, I, I don't know how many of you have, have seen the movie Imitation Games. You know, a little bit. So that goes with the, that, that tries to retrace a lot of things, but one of the main characters there is the father of computer science, right? Alan Turing. Uh, and he helps save the world. He's amazing. But I think one of the things to remember in that movie is that he actually built a computer. And if you remember, the computer they built was using uh, vacuum tubes. We're kind of in that stage for quantum computing. So we understand the theory. Obviously, not Alan, not, uh, Alan Turing that created that. So there's lots of research that created sort of the quantum theory. But we're building the computers now. Uh, so it's kind of similar in terms of in your mind. But why quantum computing, right, compared to, like, say, biological computing or the ones that we know right now, which are sort of like the classical Turing uh, computers? So it gets you into a little bit of complexity theory in a the sense that you have to understand that computation, in terms of a very abstract notion, has limits. So obviously, if you took computer, uh, computer science uh, complexity class or you understand that, you'll know that there are problems that you can solve in polynomial times. So we call these things easy problems because the classical computers uh, are very good at solving these kind of problems. And um, we are very good at that, right? So that's what we do right now. But there are problems that are hard. And that's been known for years, even at the time of Alan Turing. Uh, and those problems, uh, we pose, pose it right now, and it's still an unsolved uh, question, uh, whether or not those, you can find polynomial time problems to solve these. And when it's not, and if you can't solve it with polynomial time, because we don't know how, we call them NP-hard. And of course, there is lots of solutions that kind of gives you approximations and, and uh, heuristics. But these are hard problems. So. Uh, a uh, computer right now, like the one I have in my hand, uh, will have a hard time solving some of these hard problems. It doesn't matter how good Apple gets. Uh, you know, 10 years from now, it will be the same, just because the number of computation steps is exponential. Right? So it gets very, very big, and you're not going to be able to solve them. And the reason quantum is interesting is because quantum problems, at least quantum easy problems, kind of overlap the space of hard problems. So there are problems that are easy for quantum computers to solve that are very, very hard for uh, classical computers. And we're going to talk about one in particular, since uh, you can kind of imagine what it is, but we'll get to that. So, um, and, and the good example of it is this problem, which is factoring large numbers. So believe it or not, um, pretty much all of cryptography is based on, or at least classical cryptography, I guess you could say, is based on factoring large numbers. And it's, and it, for cryptography, we want problems that are essentially 
difficult in one direction and easy in another direction. And factoring numbers is one of those. So if I give you two numbers and I tell you multiply them, very easy. Five-year-old can probably do it. Uh, reversing that, large enough numbers, nobody here could compute it by hand. And even with the best computers, you would still take years and years, okay? That's just known for the time of the Greeks, okay? And the important thing here for this talk is that Peter Shor, um, I think he was at Berkeley, came up with an algorithm. Of course, there was no quantum computers big enough to solve his solution, but he came up with a solution, uh, I think it was 30 years ago last year, and this has been tested many, many times, and it does pretty much a constant time for factoring large numbers. And it's, it gets complicated in terms of trying to understand it, but it gets into um, something called quantum Fourier transforms, where somebody at Berkeley invented that quantum Fourier transform, QFT, and then he used that because he saw that there were patterns. And then using QFT, you can kind of uh, find the, the factors. The important thing is to run this, you need a large enough quantum computer. So no large enough quantum computers right now can do things like 256 uh, uh, digits, let's say, numbers, factors. The other important thing is the best known algorithm for factoring large numbers is pretty much exponential. And it's been known for hundreds of years, I think. Uh, and it's still th that case. Uh, we don't have a better version of that, at least for, for this problem. So. And why do you care? Well, because of cryptography, right? So it doesn't matter how um, large your uh, crypto, let's say for RSA uh, keys are, if I had a large enough quantum computer, I, can, I could crack it, okay? Now, of course, those don't exist. And um, I mean, they exist to the extent that we have 100 qubit quantum computers uh, and more, but you need around 10,000 to kind of crack the current RSA keys. And so we don't have that yet. So why, do you, why should you care, right, in some ways? You should care because obviously, um, eventually, those you know, quantum computers will get bigger. I think Microsoft announced that they will have one you know, in a few thousand at the end of the year. I haven't seen it yet, but you know, I don't know if anybody's from Microsoft here, let me know. Uh, but at least at IBM and other places, we have 100 qubits, and we keep growing them. And uh, you know, soon enough, there'll be 1,000 qubit, and maybe a breakthrough happens, right? So you should care because of that fact. But there's also another very important reason you should care, and it's because a lot of data that needs to survive, let's say, multiple years, if you're the US government, for instance, you care really deeply about that, or if you're a bank, you want secrets that will survive many, many years. And if you don't encrypt them with better encryption technology, then you're at risk of that data being harvested. So you save it, and then eventually I can just decrypt it right, with a large enough computer. So that's the big risk that we see for enterprises and certainly uh, government nation states. right. So if you ask people, experts, when is that Q day, which is the day when you know, the quantum computers are large enough to be worried about the kind of encryption we use when I connect to my bank, let's say on my phone, uh, there's various answers. And you can see kind of the range. This is a, a, a graph from Global Risk Institute. So it's definitely within the next 30 years, according to the experts. But it's getting closer. So it's probably like more in the first part of the graph versus the latter part or the, the part on your uh, right. And we have a team at IBM in Zurich that keeps track of this. And every time we ask them, they keep, because they have their own, you know, their own way to compute it. And it keeps getting closer and closer. So I can't reveal what it is because I don't want you to quote me. But it's getting scarier closer. Okay, So that's maybe the message. So how do you become quantum safe, especially for us, computer scientists? People have spent, especially our team in Zurich and various other teams across the world, over the past 10 years uh, looking at alternative uh, encryption schemes. So basically using different math, right? So the current 
encryption scheme that most people use uses very basic um, factorization, which is number theory. And what you can do is you can try to find ways to encrypt data that uses a different part of math, because then hopefully that part doesn't have a solution yet in quantum computing. And people have done this, and they came up with um, essentially a part of math called abstract algebra, where you can create lattices, and there are problems in, in this abstract world that are easy in one direction, difficult in the other, and they are very, very hard. Uh, and we believe that con no quantum computers, at least none that we can build right now, and also there is no known algorithm. And if you, wanna, if you want to understand this, I have a nice example where I use the, the people in the room to explain the solution. But it takes time, so I'll see if you're interested. Just ask me as a question. And this came about because the US government, uh, NIST, National Institute of uh, uh, Standard Technologies, I think, they ran a competition. And the good thing is the competition ran for multiple years, multiple submissions, experts, and so on. And finally, this summer, I believe in August or September, the final recommendations uh, have come out. So now we actually have final recommendations. And obviously, this takes years. So there are lots of implementation of these things. So today, you can go and try it. And that's why we were able to convert our quantum stack running Kubernetes to um, quantum safe. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Then, of course, we're IBM. Uh, you know, I think you, I don't have to preach that, but you know how much we believe in open source. Uh, um, and we took the leadership to create a foundation called PQCA, and it's part of the Linux Foundation. So you can be part of it. And as a matter of fact, uh, I wasn't at the keynote, but Paul told me that Broadcom, the person I was on stage, mentioned PQCA. So thank you for that. But basically, it's a foundation that collects all the different you know, implementations of, the, of these algorithms, the libraries, and so on. And I'll get into a little bit more details of it. Yeah. Next slide. So this is kind of a, how it's organized. We have a, a project called LibOQS that actually came from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, there's a professor there, uh, Douglas um, Stabila. He's been a leader in that space. And with his students, he created a library, a Linux library, called LibOQS that allows you to essentially load these open quantum safe or the quantum safe algorithms. Uh, we have a series of demos that you can try. There's a OpenSSL provider, because OpenSSL does things a little bit differently. So anyway, if you know about that, you'll, you'll understand why I'm saying this. And then there's a collection of the libraries, OK, as a, I'm sorry, a collection of the implementation of the algorithms. Because you want implementation not just in C, C++, but you want stuff in Rust. There's also experimental implementations, because there's a team at the Max Planck Institute in Germany where they do uh, formal verification of these algorithms. So there's lots of work going on there. Okay? And I happen to be uh, the technical uh, advisory committee board member for this. But there's multiple vendors in this uh, that are part of it, including NVIDIA, which is very active in this space. And I'll explain to you if you want to understand why NVIDIA is there. I mean, if you're part of NVIDIA, love that you're, part of, you're there. But like, people think of NVIDIA as AI, but they do a lot more, right? So they're part of Quantum. Uh, Microsoft is also, is it Microsoft? No, sorry, Google is part of it as well. And uh, anyways, go to pqca.org, you'll see the list of vendors. I don't want to miss anybody, but uh, we got some, some very uh, good group, including Meta also, uh, Facebook is, is part of it. Next slide. So yes, so pass it to Paul. OK, sorry. Cool. So right that's kind of all the background on how we built quantum safe algorithms and have them available to use. So how do we start using them? And at IBM, we talked about you know, your journey to quantum safe. And that journey has three steps. And those steps can take, you know, depending on the size of your company, they can take you know, maybe days or weeks if you're a small startup to you know, multiple years if you're a government entity or you know, a giant corporation. So what are those steps? Three steps. First one is discover. Really, you know, do you know what cryptography you're using and where you're using it? You know, we talk about S-bombs. I think you know, we heard S-bombs in the keynote today. You know, there's there's C-bombs, cryptography bills of material. So you want to kind of inventory your code and just know where am I using cryptography? If I have to update it, where do I have to update it? 
remember, if some people in Israel, you know, if people remember Y2K, you know, there's a lot of work to you know, shift, so we went from two to four digits in years. It's a similar kind of thing here. We need to know where we need to make those changes. So that's step one. Inventory your cryptography, build a C-bomb so you know where it is. Then the second step is observe. You want to know, so if we know where, you know, where, are, we using, like, where are we making these cryptographic calls in our applications? Where are they most frequently used? Kind of model the network, see where it's being used. Where are we most at risk? So we want to identify not just where we're using cryptography, but also then how it actually works in our application so we can figure out where to mitigate. And the third step is transform. So once we've identified where, where we're most at risk or where we want to start to try to mitigate these risks, we're going to start to try to implement some of these quantum safe patterns in our development environments so we can see how it works. We can test it out. We can see, are there latency hits because the cryptographic keys are a little bit bigger now? There's more data over the wire. So discover, observe, transform. That's kind of the journey to becoming quantum safe. So having said that, let's look at this practically. How can we actually do this? I know, again, in the keynote, we mentioned this is the work for the next 10 years for Kubernetes. I'm going to show some things now that we've got working that you, know, you can use today or in, in the near future. And kind of the background of this, as Mac men Max mentioned, is that we spent a lot of time at work putting this into our IBM quantum platform. Again, it's a Kubernetes-based platform that allows you to run quantum workloads and access our quantum processing units. Um, it's on the cloud, it's free to use, but anyways, in this blog, which is also free, just kind of details some of the efforts that we did in doing that. And that's kind of the basis of what we did here. So let me just set the stage a little bit. So let's look at you know, what a typical application might look like on our quantum platform. So the user will be working their laptop, they have a quantum job they want to run. And there's, on their laptop, they're going to connect the IBM quantum platform across the internet. So that goes through you know, web application firewall, hits an Istio entry point on the cluster, and then runs on a bunch of services within a Kubernetes cluster. All fairly standard. But what this gives is an idea of where are the three places that we're at risk with non-quantum cryptography. Well, the first or where do we have to update, let me say. And the first place is you know, when the request flows across the internet, it's got to get encrypted somewhere, and that happens on the user's laptop. So the, lap, the, the user's machine has to be able to encode things in quantum-safe cryptography. Some of that's a little bit out of our hands. You know, if the user doesn't update their laptop, there's not much we can do if they're using a web browser. So the second thing is if you're using a web application firewall, it's got to be protected kind of as it flows across the public internet. That's probably where you're most at risk. If you could protect across the public internet, that harvest now decrypt later um, threat gets mitigated um, quite a bit. And then the third thing, you know, we want to be zero trust. We want to make sure that we're also encrypted internally as well, using those same standards. So those are kind of the three places we need to look at. The laptop, across the public internet, and then internally. OK, so let's kind of walk through those step by step. How do we encrypt things locally? Well, we use OpenSSL. <clears throat> and how can, we turn, how can we make OpenSSL quantum safe? And it turns out it's actually quite nice, because you don't really need to mess with OpenSSL. You just need to install a couple of libraries. and. I'll walk through these here in a minute, but you just install a couple libraries, do a little bit of configuration, and you can encrypt things on your laptop with quantum-safe cryptography like that. And one of those is LibOQS, which Max mentioned. Um, you know, I run Fedora. I can DNF install LibOQS, and I've got it right there. Uh, if you're on a Mac, I think you can do brew install, but I don't know if you, to check it out. But anyways, it's fairly simple. You can download it from GitHub, put it on your laptop, you're good to go. The second piece is just a provider that plugs it. It's a plugin for OpenSSL that allows it to call out to LibOQS. So you can see kind of what happens here. When you make a cryptographic request, it calls out to OpenSSL. If you've configured OpenSSL properly, like I've done in the screenshot over there, OpenSSL will then call out to the OQS provider, which calls out to LibOQS, brings you back quantum, cryptogra or quantum cryptography, sends it back to the client, and you're good to go. You didn't touch OpenSSL. You just did a little bit of configuration. Nice, simple, all kinds of fun. So that's the client, so the user can encrypt things on their laptop. And again, the next step may be optional, but if you're using a web application firewall, you need to make sure that your web application firewall can handle quantum-safe cryptography as well. So the one that we use, which is based on Cloudflare, the IBM Cloud Internet Services, that's just a, a simple configuration, build some new servers, and you're good to go. Easy enough. So now the last step is when we hit our cluster. And again, we run Istio, so there's some configuration changes that have to be made in Istio as well. Uh, for people who aren't familiar with this, Yo, again, it runs a sidecar proxy against um, a bunch of services. There were a few keynotes this morning about Envoy as well, so hopefully that's, people are familiar with that. But basically, we have to make sure that the Envoy proxy can be quantum safe, and that change is actually already merged in upstream. I think that happened last year, so that's good to go. The boring SSL version they use 
uses, can access post-quantum cryptography, so good there. Then we had to make sure that we added quantum safe groups to Istio, which is done, so now when you hit the gateway, you can use quantum safe cryptography. And then for the service mesh, there's some ongoing work. Uh, it's kind of highlighted in that issue there, but the point being that hopefully when that merges, whole quantum stack or the whole Istio stack, it can be used quantum safe cryptography as well. So you're connected, or when you hit your cluster, you can decrypt from quantum cryptography, and then for your intra-cluster services that are talking, you're also using post-quantum cryptography there as well. Okay. So kind of a more detailed view of what this looks like. <clears throat> and the nice thing about this is the only kind of piece that, so this is, again, standard setup, We've got our client, and you notice I've got a quantum safe client and a non-quantum safe client. Again, that's up to the user. If the user uses, doesn't want to use quantum safe cryptography, everything works as normal. None of this breaks any existing application. But if the user does have quantum safe cryptography on their laptop, again, the flow is the same, but they can use it. No, nothing we had to switch on our back end, everything else is just as it is. So what happens, a request gets sent, it goes through, cloud, uh, through the firewall, hits a, a load balancer on the cluster, the load balancer routes it to Istio. Istio can then do two things. It can send it, sends it to the sidecar proxy. The sidecar proxy decrypts it from quantum safe, sends it to the regular pod. Things work as normal. So again, the only thing it changes here is just it's, the, you know, it's a sidecar proxy that can now handle quantum safe cryptography. And that puts quantum safe across the entire stack. I've got a little demo here that we'll just kind of take a look at briefly. Um, oops. Uh, quantum jobs tend to take a little bit of time to run, so I pre-recorded this to speed us along, and I gotta find my mouse, sorry. It's in the middle. There we go. All right, so just to show what we have here, so this is using a, running a thing we call a, a Qiskit function. It's a service, it's a quantum serverless uh, offering that we have, and it's basically, it's gonna run a quantum job. So this is a standard Jupyter notebook. We're gonna run the job, and at the bottom, we're gonna just kinda watch the request go across the stack. Um, and this is honestly super boring, because it's literally, let's run a job, and the request is gonna go across, and then it's gonna come back, and what happens, the job finishes. And we check its status, and the job's gonna say done, and then it's gonna shoot out a result at the bottom. And there's nothing different. That's exactly what a normal request looks like. That's kind of the beauty of this, is it's transparent to the user. But you can't just take my word for it that we actually were quantum safe. The next pieces that we wanna do is we wanna kind of verify that each of these steps that we're using the Kyber 768 algorithm. So that's the, the, the quantum safe algorithm that's used in this thing. So what we're gonna do is kind of look at each of these services and see like, is it actually using that algorithm? And we can do this fairly simply. So we're gonna look at the client. We'll use Wireshark, pop it up. And I know this is kind of small, but if you take a look, Kyber 768 is being used. So we're great, that's at the client. So when the request leaves the, the client's laptop, quantum safe which is great. When it hits the firewall, we're gonna see a similar thing. We take a look, Kyber 768, so we're quantum safe there. That's great. Hit the Istio uh, gateway, also quantum safe. And at this point, we've gone from the laptop to our cluster, so we've traversed the public internet with quantum safe cryptography at the beginning, middle, and end. So that harvest now decrypt later threat has been mitigated. Right. The last thing we'll do is we'll just take a look at one of the services um, that's running internally so we can show the intra-cluster as well, so we've protected internally. And we take a look at our function service when the request gets there. We'll pop up, and again, Kyber 768 as well. So, again, just kind of a demonstration that yeah, it's actually using that cryptography at each step along the way. So let me just swap back to the slides real quick. So that's a demo of kind of what that kind of pattern looks like. So again, there's a, you know, depending on the size of your company, it could take a while to get there. Depending on what your threat model is, it might not be the right time for you to move. It's kind of a thing you need to do. You know, it, it's not a one size or a one, a one size fits all answer. So how can you start to get ready for this? And there's two things that I, I think we should suggest. Um, the first is just learn a little bit more about quantum, uh, post-quantum cryptography. We've created a free course, like free isn't free, no money, doesn't cost you anything. 
Um, if you want to get a badge, you can put your email in. If you don't want to get a badge and just want to learn it, you can just do it, I think, with no strings attached. Um, uh, there'll be QR codes with links uh, here in a minute. Uh, but take the course. It's kind of a nice, detailed walkthrough of kind of what post-quantum cryptography is, how it works. There's hands-on examples. Um, you can learn a lot doing it. And then the second step is just to start building those C-bombs. Start to inventory where you're using cryptography. Just start to get a sense of what scope and scale you're going to be looking at um, as you move forward. Um, you know, we've done a similar look at Kubernetes, for example, and it's, there's a lot of places where there's going to need to be work done. Uh, Nikita's 10-year uh, you know, goal is not out of the realm of, of possibilities there. So those are the two things I think that would be helpful to start doing, to start thinking about, to start getting ready for meeting this risk uh, when it comes along. So again, I, I said there'd be QR codes, um, so that's for the course. Learning about C-bombs in the last, you know, please rate the session. Um, it's helpful for us to learn and improve and you know, all those kinds of fun things. So with that, I think we've got um, a bit of time for questions. Um, yeah. There's a mic uh, right there if people want to ask questions. If not, um, thanks. And yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming. Hey, good morning. Yeah, um, my it? question has to do with uh, limitations on industry. So. The demo here had it full stack from client all the way through into, into, into industrial networks and all the way down to the Kubernetes cluster. Are there any limitations uh, just imposing quantum safe cryptography inside of our internal networks? As in, can't, because we can't control clients and how, how quickly they upgrade, um, is, is, do you see a path forward perhaps as sort of a short term solution in securing our networks in? Uh, making it so that when requests come in, they're sort of re-encrypted, or maybe sort of a man-in-the-middle type of a thing, but a white hat man-in-the-middle where you're re-encrypting it in quantum safe just to secure your own internal stuff before you mandate something on a client? Like hybrid? Uh, sort of model. like that, yeah. Um, is that a thing? There is, there, I guess the question is, is there a hybrid, and can you, you know, what do you do with clients that are not going to be uh, quantum safe and, gonna, and you want to still support them? Exactly. Um, we, we haven't looked at that, but I, I know there was some discussion about hybrid. Yeah, we, we so, and to your kind of more specific point, if the, in our demo, if the user wasn't using post-quantum cryptography and they, when they send it in, when it hits the gateway, it can re-encrypt it in post-quantum and, and do it internally. Yeah. So it, 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 it can do that. So you could, in theory, if you wanted to encrypt your stuff internally, that could be totally fine. Like that's, that's definitely doable. That's one of, that is one of the models that we've looked at. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we haven't deployed that. But the, the other thing I would say is that because the client uh, that people use are the browsers, uh, the browser companies, uh, you know, when they do make things quantum safe, that's going to be great. And I know that Google has a Chromium version that is quantum safe already. And other clients, like, for instance, text messages, uh, Apple released a blog in the summer where they discussed where some of you might be running quantum safe already because they, they kind of had that in the iMessage. So um, yes, you can do it, but clearly having a client that is default quantum safe will be great. Fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Next question. Yeah, hi. Um, it was to yeah, follow up on what you just responded. Do you know like the status or like the time frames for browser standardization, and is there any tech, maybe before then, if you're using a browser, potentially like WebAssembly to like encrypt it in quantum safe? So the question is, do we know the time frame for the browser? No. <laughs> um, I, so I, I, we're not talking to Google. I, I, I guess this is a good question for PQCA, actually, because the Google rep does come, and we could probably ask him about that. But I don't have an answer um, for that question. But they do have a version right now that you can go use uh, that I know. So if you Google Chromium Quantum Safe, then you can go use it right now. I think it might have actually moved into upstream Chrome as well. Is it? I, I okay. think it's in Chrome. I think it's in Firefox. Um, Firefox might be you have to flip a switch, but don't quote me on that. But I think it's in, I'm pretty sure it's in Chrome as of like a release or two ago. I think I saw something. But again, I think yeah, we should trust, 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 but, trust but verify. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I think it's in Chrome. Right. And at that, at that point, when it's in browsers, then you just need to, as you mentioned, like. All right, now you have to have your servers yeah, converted so yeah, and so on. Be able yeah. to do that. Which is why we're encouraging people to understand 
where you're using cryptography with CBOM, so that way you can start getting ready. Especially for the part of your system that you really care the data not to be harvested. Right. So thanks, thanks for that question. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So since November 6th, last year. Thanks for giving this oh, talk. This, year, right? this was uh, really interesting. Um, so I guess kind of chaining off the, the series of questions here, um, besides it not being in the, ready in the browsers quite yet, November 6th you said, um, are there any pitfalls or reasons we shouldn't be actively seeking to be rolling this out right now in our production systems? Back at the libpqc slide it said production ready. Are there, are there any reasons not to? Or right. should we be going at this now to prevent yep. that capture and So the question is, is there any reason not to go quantum safe today? Um, I guess you're asking the wrong people <laughs> because we'll say no. Well, I guess I, I can think okay. of one. So there is, so the, the post-quantum algorithms are bigger than the classical ones, so they require more bits to wrap them. Um, I don't remember, Cloudflare actually just put out a blog, I want to say this week, probably, it could have been, um, it was, I think it was this week, but with looking at like the, the latency and, and the, 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 on the timings on them, on the different algorithms. And it's non-trivial, so I, I, don't, I, I can't quote numbers to you, but they're, there's a, there's, they're bigger. And so that's you know, more bytes across the wire. There can be latency. So to, again, you have to threat model this for your own business, your own risk. Um, but yeah. there, there is a bit more, they are a bit more, you know, they're, they're bigger. So there's trade-offs to that. I mean, there's trade-offs to all security things. That's kind of something you have to answer individually. At a certain point, you know, when they have big enough quantum computers, that size is going to be immaterial because it would be like, I mean, nobody sends any, hopefully no one sends anything unencrypted across the internet these days. Uh, but you would be like that at, at a, a certain point. So that trade-off, you know, we're going to have to deal with that trade-off at some point, and they'll, hopefully they'll get smaller. Yeah. But that, that's the one thing that comes to mind about why you may not want to do it right now. But it's something you have to model and, for your own threat. Yeah, and, 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 you know, if you asked that question maybe three months ago, I would say, there is a risk because the, the standards are not officially recommended, so they could change, so you'd have to change your code and so on. But now that they are recommended, I would say if you have data or systems that you really, really worry about that data being harvested, like you work for the government or you have financial information or any kind of information like this, then I'd say get started today. I, I, don't, I think it's important. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. My question is really, do you have full MLDSA support in this, too? Because you're just saying dilithium a lot, but MLDSA is a little bit different from some of the changes in yeah. the final spec? We have, uh, I think, implementation in PQCA, yes. So, Excellent. Yeah, for sure. And that's maybe one of the risks for the previous question is that the implementation are changing. The, the recommendations are there, but the implementation are changing. So you might have to keep up, but hey. If you're in this space of software, you know you got to keep stuff up to date. So it's nothing new. Right? One thing to piggyback off on that is that we didn't mention here, but one of the, I think it was mentioned in the, I think it was mentioned in the keynote, um, but the idea of crypto agility. Yes. Um, you know, Y2K, we hard coded in four digits, and that's going to be a problem at a certain point. You know, it won't impact any of us, but at some point we're going to we're going to add more digits to years. Um, you know, a lot of our crypto is hard coded right now, and we're making the change because the RSA was 1978, and Peter Shore was 1994. So we had a good 15 year run there with oh, our cryptography is perfect; we don't have to worry about it. Now we know that you know quantum computers can break, you know, factoring large numbers. Lattices, you know, we think are good. No one's proven that a, any crypt, a computer can break them, but 15 years down the line, they might get broken and when you're gonna be able to move again. So we don't wanna, we wanna do this in a way that makes it crypto agile so we can think of our cryptography as modular. We can plug in new ones when they come. Configuration, so that, basically. Yeah. So as, you know, as the implementation change thing, we don't wanna you know, just say, okay, we'll write this in, hard code it, and then, oh, well, the implementation's not good, we gotta rewrite it or redo it. We wanna make it so that we can plug it in to be crypto agile. So I think that's an important point to raise here too. And we have 50 seconds left, so we can definitely take you as the last question. So go Real for quick. it. So, so from my perspective, the biggest risk of adopting the quantum safe crypto is the immaturity of the cryptography itself relative to the status quo, right? So, I mean, take for example, NIST, and they produced their finalists, and I think one of them got, got totally denied, like de destroyed, right? Without a quantum computer existing. So. Um, I, I think it seems to me like there could be future attacks against, you know, unknown right now, but known in the future, uh, just non-quantum attacks, just plain yeah. algorithmic attacks 
um, against these new algorithms because they're, they're relatively new. So we go and adopt these new quantum safe algorithms and then that, we're, it, even without a quantum computer, we might actually just be sending our stuff over the internet unencrypted effectively. I, I right? think the risk is so, low. So I'm, I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering, I understand. I'm wondering if, if, if you can play the NSA game and, yeah. and, and do things twice, right? You do it with the... I'm going to use Lipta Curtiff Hillman, and I'm going to use. But I think that that yeah. gets into. Yeah, we, I, sh I should mention we they are they're being wrapped in both. So it's using hybrid cryptography. So it's if you I didn't show it, but like the 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 algorithm was still whatever two two five six nine, Kyber. So it's classical encryption and post quantum encryption together. So you're both, no yeah. you're no worse off. If, if, these, if you know, they break Kyber tomorrow, you're absolutely no worse off than you are today if you wrap it with the, with the hybrid algorithm. Is that how all the... the it, again, the it's going to depend on implementation, but work. everything right. that's recommended is use hybrid. Um, the recommendation is hybrid, yeah. Not, I'm sorry, I should have been a little clearer about that, but yeah, it's hybrid, classical, and post-quantum. And, and being agile means you can change things, and yep. you should be ready for that. So anyways, right. thank so you thank for you everybody. coming. I appreciate it.